Uh, and I got the fun part of fitting models with Parsnip. Um, so John provided us with some learning objectives. Um, I thought this chapter was like uh, maybe surprisingly short, but like the one section, uh, and that's kind of like dealing with model in, in, uh, interfaces and specifying models was probably like the densest piece. And that's where most of these learning objectives fall. So um, if we were to look at a modeling roadmap uh, and this beautiful piece of art that I crafted, um, you know, we've kind of like pulled in data, we've trained test split, we've created some recipes. Arguably, this tune thing could either be here or here. Uh, but we're just focused on fitting models, right? So, and that's why we're here. Um, so fun little map. Uh, I did set up um, some data splitting and everything else to begin with. This is right out of the, the book, so it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, but those are the examples I'll use as we kind of coax our way along. And then uh, obviously, please stop, ask questions. It's great to have a nice dialogue. Um, okay, so I will zoom in a little bit here. Um, so creating a model. Um, there are a part of having an open source community means there is opportunity for people to create different things. So um, one of the ways that uh, like people create things are with packages. And a lot of the packages that people create are modeling packages because we are in the R community, right? So you could have someone create like a, a package that looks like X interface uh, or, you know, something a little nicer and easier on the, the middle part of your palm, right? So what do those model interfaces look like, right? Um, for the same type of model, you could have different implementations and that's what we kind of see here. So for the stats, uh, the base stats package, right? You know, their interface is LM, they take a formula and then you pass it a, a data frame. Whereas uh, Glimnet, uh, you know, it has an XY interface, right? And it, you know, instead of passing a data frame, you pass it a matrix, right? So if we're kind of like hearkening back to like there's there's no free lunch theorem and you want to swap through a bunch of different models quickly because you don't know what's going to be the best model, um, it kind of helps to have a consistent interface. And that's kind of what that first section is really trying to entail is to say, yes, there are a lot of interfaces and tidy models, specifically Parsnip is trying to solve for that. Um, so we go down to like, here's another crappy analogy and a, a, a beautiful piece of art that I drew, um, like the model specification. And it really has like two and sometimes three components. Um, if we're using uh, like building a car analogy, you have like the frame or the chassis or the vehicle body. Uh, and you really special, specify like like a mathematical method, right? So is this linear regression? Is this a random forest? Is this a dot, 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 you fill in the blank. And then depending on that mathematical uh, model, you set different engines or implementations of it, right? So this goes back to the, yep, people have different impl implementations for the same thing. Uh, and you want to quickly be able to swap in and out of each one of those. Um, and then this mode piece, um, that's really for models that have like, in my car analogy here, I uh, uh, heart, like translated it to, um, you know, something with four wheel drive, not all cars have it, but the ones that do is, is like a extra feature. Uh, but, you know, think of like random force, right? It can do regression, it can do classification. And we're just really telling that model which one of these we, we actually want. Uh, so basically, right here is this picture into more specific words. Um, you know, you're going to specify the model type, right? So it's going to be linear regression, random force. You're going to set some specification. And this is really that, that engine uh, that you want to say, I want Glimnet to make my linear regression or whatever. Uh, and in the case of, hey, I have some special model that can do both, you, you got to tell it like, hey, this is a regression versus a classification, right? So bringing that all together, right? 
hey, we're going to make a specification. We're going to say it's linear regression. And we're going to set the engine to just a regular LM model. And then printing that out, you kind of get this um, maybe not too comprehensive output, but it at least tells you um, what's going on with that, uh, that object. Um, so model fitting, uh, back to this idea that like you can have like multiple inputs. Um, model fitting kind of falls into that category, right? Like you can fit it with like, hey, just taking that same model specification and fitting it with a formula and a data frame. Or you can be a little more uh, explicit and feed it in X, Y. Um, now, why this is important, uh, I had, I don't know, uh, reading the chapter, and I don't know if someone has like a clear understanding why, but it seems like this fit X, Y, it doesn't break things out into dummy variables where the formula method does. Um, now, I don't know why they, it, they basically rely on the underlying engine to do this, to like, hey, if I fed it like a dummy variable or a categorical column, it would break it out into a bunch of dummy variables. It would rely on the package to do that. And I don't know what the benefit of that delayed execution is. And I don't know if anyone else has an idea or thought behind it. I've in parallel to this book, Jordan, I've been reading the um, the, the feature engineering book that yep. um, Max wrote. And in the chapter on dummy variables, he does speak about um, um, random forests and other decision tree based algorithms. There's there's a commentary in that book, a comparison, and in some cases the the decision tree handles factors inside of the decision tree rather than explicit dummies. And sometimes there's some advantages. Uh, are and those I, advantages I think, computation? Because I wouldn't imagine it would be on the output, right? It, yeah, it, it, there, there are some differences in, um, well, because they're decision trees. <laughs> That there are some dis differences even in computation and and even some advantages because the um, because the trees have the factors intact um, the way it can group them um, looks a little different it yields different trees okay that's interesting hmm. I, it, it it's in I guess if anybody's interested it's in I think chapter six, chapter five or chapter six of the feature engineering book separately. Okay. Yeah, I'll, well, I'll have to peruse. That's brand new information. Um, so uh, one of the benefits of having opinion, like an opinionated package is you can start expecting similar behavior across multiple things, right? So, um, one of the benefits of you know moving towards parsnip is hey generalized model model arguments you know one of the pains of the past of like hey i want to implement a bunch of different models and test things out is you would have to slightly change your syntax for the exact same things right so when we are looking at parsnip to solve this problem you know it kind of breaks things down into two uh, types of arguments you have main arguments which are kind of like mathematically specific, like, hey, for decision trees, you're going to have like a number of trees. That's a pretty common argument. You don't need to name it something different every single time. Um, whereas there's also more specific engine arguments, which you might have to be aware of, but they should all have a very similar naming convention, right? So I think one of the examples he uses in the book is like Lambda. Um, you know, mathematically, you know, mathematicians look at that and they're like, oh yeah, that's like the, the penalty, but you know, it's probably easier just to call it a penalty, um, right? Uh, so he talks a little bit about that. Um, now, uh, 
hey, here's a bunch of different examples that are straight from the book that say, hey, yep, everyone's naming thing the same thing differently. And parsnip is just sits between all the different uh, options to say that thing and you know just calls it trees. Uh, so that's thumbs up. It makes uh, programming that much easier. Uh, and then you know some some fun things that we can do is we can use some of that translate function to kind of see how those arguments are getting populated. Um, so here are just the two examples out of the book. Um, hey, I can take the linear regression specification, set the engine to LM, and I translate it, and it actually kind of fills in um, some of the mandatory arguments for it, right? Uh, whereas with Glimnet, right, you have oh. Hey, same type of deal, but you know you get some extra stuff where it's specifying the family because it can do multiple things and whatever else. Uh, so that was what I had for creating a model. Um, when we use model results, uh, why do I have to zoom in on every single page? That's kind of great. Um, using model results, right? We can take the model that we fitted from. here um, and we can pass it to the tidy function from the broom package. Now uh, I look at the tidy fun function from broom as pure magic. I just know I pass it a bunch of stuff and it returns a nice pretty table. And this kind of goes into um, one of the philosophies is you know you you want things to return predictable behavior. So hey, if I can just pass in any model formula and it prints me out like, some nice code, like nice variables, the terms and their coefficients and their p values. That's that's all the better. Um, you can also pass a glance and you can return some model summary statistics, which is also fun. Um, I feel like I'm going lightning fast through this. Um, lastly, we can do predictions, and this was one of. Um, I know early on I would always run into this problem. Depending on the the modeling package you are using, it would either omit um, variables that had NAs in them when you don't necessarily want to exclude those, right? That's something like, hey, even if it doesn't score it, I want to know that it didn't score it. And if you're omitting it, well, now it's gone, and now you have to, you know, debug and fall down a rabbit hole, right? So, you know, some of the rules to live by here, right? You know. Uh, tibble in, tibble out, uh, it's going to return a data frame. There are some prediction functions that don't, uh, and that's kind of uh, annoying to deal with. Um, column names are predictable, like, hey, everything will be named dot pred or dot class one or whatever. Uh, and then, you know, this is kind of what I was talking about earlier was, hey, the tibble that you send it, it will return the same number of observations, even if it has an NA. And that's what's like, I find super awesome for debugging things and everything else. So um, prime example here, right? Hey, we just created a, a small test set. Um, we're predicting it, right? So we pass it our, our form fit to the predict function give it the new data. If this was null, um, this would just predict or return the, the fitted values for the training set. Um, and then you can see like, yep, I passed it five values. It returned five values. And it gave me a nice, pretty column name. Um, right, And then we can use the bind columns function, the bind calls function to do the same thing, but return or stitch these onto our, uh, our our training set, right? So you always want to compare, like, hey, how close were the predictions to the actuals? And now you can do some like root mean squared error or whatever your fun test metric is. Um, so that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, lastly, um, before we kind of start wrapping things up, I really feel like I lightning round this. Um, there are like because this is a this is an opinion, you can share the opinion and you know it translates to other methods. So uh, one of the examples he mentions is the discrim package in the book. Uh, I went to their their 
Git uh, page and just pulled some sample code. Um, and instead of like, hey, just lin, lin regression and you know whatever, random forest, do you have like a new mathematical vehicle which is discrim flexible, right? You set a new, you use the same type of arguments of set engine, and then you use the package that helps you do that. Uh, so you get some pretty cool examples here, right? So, hey, the screen flex, there is some terms here that you would give it, uh, fit engine, and then same, same process as before. So that's pretty fun and exciting. And then you can have a nice little pretty graph. Um, okay, so summary. Uh, and I think these are like really the core concepts of the chapter, right? You want a common interface, right? This helps you iterate through models really, really quickly. You know what to do. You know the arguments are always going to be consistent and the same. And it has very predictable behavior, right? So tibble in, tibble out, same number of observations, return for predict. Um, and so the chapter wasn't very long, but it was dense for that create the model piece. And it was really just trying to say like, hey, this is the key piece of what Parsnip is trying to accomplish, right? Common interface. Um, thoughts, ideas, questions. Uh, I felt like I was just talking at you guys. Uh, does anyone have like an opinion on whether you should be always explicit with like uh, set mode or uh, the, the part where you set well, set the mode? Uh, so, say you're doing like logistic regression, right? Should you say, oh, I also need to set the mode to classification? Like if it's already implied uh, by the model framework you're using, um, it'll default to the right one. I just don't know if it's like, I don't know, just for clarity for reading uh, code later, if it's better to always be explicit on that. Right. And I like, I don't know, I, I think that was like, a, at least for me, um, like, I can see it being a thing, like, but then I could also see the other side of the argument, where it's like, yeah, it's just like a LM function, you know, it doesn't have classification, why would you even need to? Uh, so I don't know, for readability, I think it, it makes sense. But how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? I'll, I'll add that there are different, I don't think we're there yet to, to model effectiveness, but some metrics are only available to the different modes. And so I could see that being one benefit of setting your mode explicitly because some metrics might not be available to you if you assume that it's one and, uh, and you, have, you have the wrong mode set at the top. Right. I guess there was some discussion in the book about uh, you know prefixing their output columns names with the uh, the dot in the front. Uh, I personally think that's actually good. I, I don't know if everyone has that same opinion though. I think it's. I think it's safer. It's a, a bit unnatural for me to, to put the dot as I'm typing the variable name because I just never use dots. But I guess that's why it works because almost no one has dots. I don't think you actually need to type dot pred. It will return as a default the prediction with dot pred like as the, as the name. I don't think you're actually like naming it that no it's, but i mean it's kind of like I'm, the way default args work right right now like, I, I guess I, I guess i was speaking more like if i'm making a plot afterwards in, G, in, in ggplot you have to type in dot pred and that's just not yeah the way my brain works because i've never used dots before outside of this this package I definitely yeah i think it makes sense as soon as i find it but i've also been a situation where I create a prediction and it, it wasn't using dot pred and you get like dot dot 58 like it just names it after the column and so I appreciate that it's got a you know a, <laughs> Jim's laughing at it. he might have been there before 
Uh, that it's got like a, a standard, uh, like Jordan was talking about, expected output. And you can just write like a common mutate function to be like, ah, oh, after uh, a nice little helper function, ah, oh, if it's got a period in from it, remove it, right? Um, I don't know. No, so well, I, I thought this chapter was pretty quick. Um, I don't know if you guys thought it was the same. Uh, has anyone fed extra arguments into the set engine function. And so I, I, we talked a little bit about the, the inputs that they already have defined, but it seems like there are, there are, if you have custom calls to, custom calls to your engine, you can feed them in through set engine. Has anyone had experience with that? I, I tried yeah, I, I was actually going to bring that up. I, um, I, I had actually done like quantile regression with Ranger before. And so I think you pass that in through set engine. I think if I recalled, it was a little harder to work with the output though. Like, so I think, I don't know if I could use Broom for it because I wanted like different quantiles in the default quantile. And so I think you, I think I had the right own predict function for that. Uh, maybe I'm misremembering, but yeah, that was an interesting use case to pass in quantiles uh, for a ranger. Uh, just because I think the other more popular quantile regression libraries, uh, I think they either have like, uh, you know, C dependencies or something that made it harder to install on the system I was using, but it was a good use case for a uh, range right there. There you go. Pan, save me from the silence. Hi, I've, I've got a question that may or may not have been answered because my laundry got, yeah. Um, the, uh, can you use fit underscore X, Y with like categorical data or would you need to make the dummy vars itself? I saw something about on your screen, like you had a delayed creation of oh, the dummy vars. Th so that, that fit X, Y is basically just passing um, that creation to the the model or the the package implementation of what the model you're using right so when you use the formula the formula the formula does that when you use fit xy it's saying like hey don't touch it let the package handle that with however it's going to handle it so it's it's still processing somehow uh and it's more like hey the package is doing that process versus the formula does that answer your question so it requires a packet, like, I guess if you have categorical data for what, I, like for the housing thing, for the neighborhood, if that's categorical, like, would you have to use an engine whose like model itself has like some way to deal with categorical data and detect it? So I'm assuming like, uh, and maybe this, there's probably going to be some edge case, right? Like uh, what is happening? Like if I had some category, Oracle var variable here, what ends up happening is this engine is going to process it and not this formula, right? So uh, in the context that Jim was uh, describing earlier, he was saying like, hey, there are some decision trees that process that, that column very differently, right? So instead of that formula creating it and you know altering that data set before you give it to the engine, you're just giving the data set as is, and then the engine can decide how it handles that categorical variable if I'm understanding correctly. And what would the advantage for that be, I guess? It's like, why would you not want to have it done up front? Uh, because the, the model that you're using or the engine that you're using uh, handles it its own way versus you telling it how to handle it. OK. Like, does it just save you time, you as the like model creator? Or no. yeah, I guess like, yeah. It, it's not saving you time, right? It is um, like, and maybe this is like a good analogy, and I hope hopefully it lands. Like, um, 
hey, I don't want to do my tax. Like I could like fill out all my tax inter information and then give it like, just say, hey, uh, tax broker, whoever, can you handle my taxes now? Don't do anything else. Or I can give them all the documentation, like, hey, my W-2, my everything else, and then say, just handle my taxes for you or for me, right? So in that, that second scenario, that's what we're doing with like the delayed execution. We're saying like, hey, I don't wanna actually do anything with this categorical variable. I want you to handle it, engine. Um, does that make sense? Because you're not necessarily saving time. It's just you're letting the package decide how to handle that variable. Yeah, that, that does make sense. Thank you. But how does that kind of translate like in the whole recipes thing? I, I know we're talking about putting everything together in the next chapter, but like, would you ever use or have any of you guys used fit X, Y with the recipe? Because it sounds like if you're using a recipe to kind of say like, I'm turning this variable into a predictor and this one into, you know, uh, the predicted. Um, how come, yeah, like, would you use those or separate them? I guess, like, I'll, I'll say, like, I haven't used the fit XY. Um, and it would have to be, like, I, I would think of this as, like, one of those cases where you would need to know what that package implementation is doing and the benefit of it, right? So I think the chapter, did you say it was chapter six, Jim? In the, the feature engineering book? Yeah, I put a link in the, in the comments if anybody's interested, but I'll admit I, I never use the XY myself, um, but, but Max discusses some gotchas with categoricals. Um, I think in like Ames neighborhood, just imagine there's a few neighborhoods with not many houses. And, and so when you do resampling or, or splits, you may, you may have some categories that aren't represented or, um, and, and so the, the engines, allowing the engines to deal with categories um, sometimes yields a better result. Um, and so he, he makes that point in the other book, but it's, it's rare. And, and he, he attempted in the other book to show some charts on the difference in accuracy, and it isn't much. Um, so it's, it's an odd, uh, I think the phrase edge case was used before. I, I think that truly this is, you know, out there where, where um, if, if you've got some categories with most of the data and then some odd ones and you haven't dealt with them with embeddings or hashing or some other means then, then um, but one mechanism to allow the engine to handle the categories as, as, um, as, a, as, a, as the way a decision tree could is, is to use the XY interface instead of making explicit dummies in front. Thank you. 